I'm back. Hello, world. I am again uh, going to address you this time. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about me. No, enough about me. Let's talk about me. Um, I have been working for FASA for a few years now. Um, if you are just tuning in for the first time to any of the talks that I've been doing this weekend, uh, I am an art director for uh, FASA Games. I primarily work with 1879. I am the uh, writer-illustrator of Champions Challenge as well as the Hey Penny Pie uh, webcomic uh, gone to graphic novel. Um, but I started with FASA in the um, in the uh, freelance uh, art and illustration mode. So um, let's get right to it. Um, well, as I said, uh, or as the schedule suggests, this is about the process. How did I get to where I'm at, and how do I do what I do for pro uh, for FASA? This afternoon, I talked about the comics specifically. Now let's talk about some illustration. So, let me switch my... There you go. Ta-da! And this is... Ross, oh, probably going to be old hat for you um, in that um, you've seen this presentation before. Um, but this is in all... In that case... <laughs> I'll catch you all guys later. I had a feeling. Good night, Ross. <laughs> Anyway, um, this is, as I said, probably uh, a, a lot about my history and how I do, how I've gotten to uh, work for FASA and and um, my time as an illustrator. So, um, like a lot of artists, I started um, very young. I started when I was eight years old, um, and I was interested in Disney. And all of that kind of thing. Let's see if I can get to here. Hello. There. I started working with Disney. Um, not working for Disney. I started at eight years old. And this isn't the actual <laughs> drawing I did. Um, but when I was eight years old, we'd go to a place called Lake Lower Me in Dayton, Ohio. And being eight years old, I was bored silly. Uh, so one day I sat down and I drew a picture of Grumpy. And it, uh, my, I took it to my mom and I showed it to her and uh, she looked at it and she goes, oh, that's pretty good. That's nice tracing. And I said, I didn't trace it. And she goes, sure, you didn't draw it twice as big if you didn't trace it. So, well, I was eight years old. It took me a little while, but I, a couple hours and I came back twice as big. She never left me alone from that point on. <laughs> it was constant. And, what are you doing in front of the television set? Go draw a picture. Um... It, it, uh, it, she ran a close gambit. Um, she uh, always wanted to encourage me, um, but was always on that edge of pushing too hard. Um, like a lot of kids, if it became work, it wouldn't be fun anymore, and I'd drop it. And she didn't want me to drop it. So um, she kept she kept on me. She was like the first inspiration, my mom. Uh, my father, also very uh, creative. He was a wood carver um, and uh, an award-winning wood carver. Um, he uh, always wanted me to draw uh, animals and, and things of, uh, like that. He loved it when I worked with animals. But Grumpy is where I started. And that soon became... Oops. That became Snoopy because he was easy to draw. He was quick to draw. I could draw a bunch of them easily. Um, but I went to Snoopy and the, the, the comic strips in, in, in the newspaper. Drew them all the time. And that went through until about 7th grade. And in 7th grade, I ran across Rankin and Bass. And particularly The Hobbit. And... This was so much to me, and the creativity, and the, and the lore, and everything, heavily into uh, Rankin and Bass, and they were a strong influence on me artistically growing up. 
from there. The, huh. Yeah, you might have heard of this little movie. Uh, I, I was drawing a lot of animals when I was uh, a kid um, to keep my dad happy, but this movie came out in 77. And... Yeah, um, everything went to monsters and aliens and, and that kind of stuff. And my father was depressed. <laughs> like, he, he did not understand this at all. Um, he didn't get the, get the, he didn't get it. Um, but that's where I went. And then the Hildebrandt brothers right after that. And more uh, fantasy and Lord of the Rings. Um, when I realized there was more to Lord of the Rings than what Rankin and Bass did. The, oh, and it, it, worlds opened up and monsters and adventure. And then I found Rockwell. Really heavily found Rockwell. And the storytelling that Rockwell could do. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but it, it was his storytelling ability that was that was really... Um, what drove me to illustration as opposed to art in general, specifically illustration, the, the ability to tell a story in, a, in one picture. I also uh, ran across um, early on a, a gentleman by, oh wow, the name, it just, um, he wrote uh, Kingdom of the Dwarves. Um, oh wow, the name has just jumped out of my head. Um, Fortunately, I've got the book right here. David Thorne Wenzel. That's why. I don't know why. It just... His name just jumped out of my head. Anyway, David Thorne Wenzel. Um, he was a heavy influence. Uh, his pencils. Alan Lee uh, also. And Brian Froud. Heavy, heavy influences uh, for me growing up. From there... You cannot be a fantasy artist without having been or being influenced by Frank Frazetta. It's, you just can't get past it. He is the, for lack of a better term, all father of everything that is fantasy art. Everybody goes there at some point. Um, this particular piece that he did, I did a uh, study of it in uh, my high school days. And finished the piece just in time to have my portfolio reviewed by the senior teacher. I, this, I did that my junior year of high school. Did a rendition of it. And it was hanging on the wall for the senior teacher to review my artwork over the weekend uh, when it was my turn of, of all the juniors. And I was in a show uh, doing theater. And went home, did my show, um, woke up the next morning. My father's knocking on the bathroom door and he goes, which building of the vocational school were you in? And I'm like, the East Building? And he goes, oh no. And I'm like, what? And he goes, your school just burned down. It was struck by lightning and caught fire and the whole school burned down. Everything I had from eight years old till my junior year was gone. I, I had to start from scratch. So every time I see this particular Frazetta piece, it brings back a really painful memory because I worked hard on that piece. And, well, whatever. It, 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 it is what it is. But um, I had to start over and start rebuilding the portfolio. Then I found Amsel. Amsel is probably the precursor to Drew Struzan. Um, admire both of them, but Amsel did a lot of movie posters, did a lot of uh, uh, t TV guide and, and those kind of uh, uh, entertainment illustration. But his people, his, his, his characters have always fascinated me, particularly this, this one of John Wayne in The Shootist. Just amazing stuff. Um, but again, high, he heavily influenced uh, my work. Um, and again, Drew Struzan. Um, this is one of my favorite movies, actually. Um, Big Trouble in Little China. Um, studied Drew Struzan, the, the, the composition, 
um, and so forth of, of these types of uh, this type of work I, fascinated me and it's what I wanted to do um, and work in fantasy then um, I discovered Ian McKegg Ian McKegg um, if you notice here on the screen he is the guy who invented or created the character Darth Maul um, Wow, um, and it's just pencil work, and everything that he does just fascinates me completely. Um, I had an actual, actually, I had an opportunity to meet him uh, at a uh, master's class I've done, um, and uh, great guy uh, to to work and learn from. Um, but I had an opportunity to to uh, spend some time learning from him at a master's class. And great guy, and he he's just when you think you've you've learned all you're going to be able to learn. Now it's 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 develop. No, he's got all kinds of more stuff that you can learn, and it's really a hard thing to 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 keep keep learning over again. That you have always got more to learn, and McKeg I, Ian he he pointed that out again. Uh, one of his uh, great lessons to me at uh, the the uh, master's class was turn the f and TV off. Um, he's it's like just it's not just background noise. Turn it off. You don't need it. Turn it off. Um, and that's probably the best advice I ever got that I don't seem to manage to take. Um, but. Um, that, that was one of his greatest pieces of advice for me. Turn the and TV off. Now my art director, my fiance, she quotes him periodically at me. <laughs> she'll see me when I'm supposed to be working and she'll just walk by the drawing table. Turn the and TV off. <laughs> but again, it's, it's back to my mom too. What are you doing in front of the television set? Go draw a picture. Now I've got a bunch of people telling me to turn off the TV. Whatever. But, uh, so, from there, Bernie Wrightson. Bernie Wrightson's inks. Oh, my God. And for the longest time, it was Bernie Wrightson, Bernie Wrightson, Bernie Wrightson. Then I realized it was a precursor to Bernie Wrightson. That's Franklin Booth. But the style and the inking is what's important here. Um, it's something I aspire to. Um, don't think I've reached it, but it's what I, I, I aspire to. And um, let's see here. Make sure that everybody's hearing me. Uh, Andy, do I have any questions yet or, or anything? Nope. nope. Okay. Um, well, no, hold on. Hold on. No. Okay. There's a, there's a bot thing that I have to get rid of. Well, I don't know that I can get rid of it. Okay. Let have... me know if anybody's got questions. No, but I will say your art style, I can totally see this in you. Thank you. Thank you. It's something I aspire to. So, um, Bernie Wrightson and Franklin Booth. Because of all the Amcel and things like that and everything, we're going to go back to seventh grade. This was the piece that made my mom the proudest. This original, she managed to keep out of my portfolio uh, when, the, the, when the school burnt down. She actually kept it and had it at the house. So I didn't lose this piece. But it's a rendition of uh, this thing that I studied, again, seventh grade, uh, trying to emulate Amsel and uh, his work for this thing. Um, I look at it now and I'm like, <laughs> but it's not bad for a seventh grader. But it, still, that was way back then. And that that is like one of the first pieces that... I did. Um, from there, many, many, many years, lots and lots and lots and lots of lots of practice. I started uh, doing um, cards, illustrated cards, um, like sketch cards is what they call them. Um, and to get the attention of Tops, I did a series on the Lord of the Rings, and um, these are two of the cards that I did. Um, Sam and Frodo. Those are actually two separate cards that. Um, when, if you bought them together, that they lined up that way so that it was it was one scene, but it worked. I got the attention of Tops, 
um, uh, and they asked me to do a series of original sketch cards for, for baseball and a few other things, but there's some of the sketch cards I did for um, baseball cards for tops. Now, again, what they would do is they would take these original illustrations and stick them into packs. Um, I did a, uh, in a, in a um, three-week three week time period, I did 65 sketch cards this level. No, 75 sketch cards at this level. I was allowed to keep seven for my for my own use or for my own portfolio but all of them they would put them in packs as original pieces of art and I as well as many other artists did did, did these the the this style of cards and I did some work for them for a while um but I realized at the end I was getting very little out of this and they were getting a lot um I don't know if anybody's got any of these cards out there um but if for some reason somebody somewhere sometime realizes they've got and i and i actually make much something out of my career there's going to be higgins original artwork um and bring it to me and i'll sign it and, and, and see if it's worth anything after that <laughs> um so what else have i done um my first magic card um also i did this at gen con um, people were bringing blank magic cards uh, to people in the artist alley. And they asked me, um, they, they brought one to me and they said, have you done any magic cards? I'm like, no, no, I haven't. Thanks anyway. And they said, no, no, no. We love your style. We love what you're doing. Would you draw us a magic card? And I'm like, okay, well, anything you want to put in the windows, anything you want to put in the windows, that's put, fill the windows, fill the windows. And that's all they kept saying. Now I'm I've seen some of the people who had done sketch cards of of blank magic cards and they fill it with a dragon or they fill it with this and they they make a scene out of it and, and that's great. But they made such a big deal out of the windows. I just had I just hang on. I, I they made such a big deal out of the windows, that's what I envisioned as a gremlin or or, or, or troll or whatever some guy washing the windows <laughs> and that's what I did. They loved it and that's how it worked out. Yes, Andy. I was going to ask you keep saying windows. I was wondering if like that's cute, but I don't think that that's what they meant. No, that's not what they meant. And they said that I could fill the window with anything I wanted to, and they made a big deal out of window 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 and they said it about 150 times at me. Then it's like, okay. You didn't know what it was either? No, I, I asked what the window was. No, it's it, I knew what they meant. But I'm like, okay, they know I'm 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 a I'm I, I'm a prankster. They know that I that I uh, I I make jokes. They knew, and um, I knew what they meant by the window. But I'm like, okay, I'll fill the window the way I want to fill the window and put a window washer in there. And it's still a fantasy type character or creature. And when I showed it to them. They loved it. They 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 were thrilled, and they took it right over to a friend of theirs, um, who was turns out to be the guest of honor that year, um, who jumped up and down laughing and came over and shook my hand, and said this is this was brilliant. It, 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 the whole story got told to him. He comes over, he shook my hand, um, and we hit it off. A gentleman by the name of Tony Dieter Lizzie, and he. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't say we're great friends or anything like that, but he, he got, he got it and he understood and he, he thought that was extremely, uh, funny and apropos and that, that's my first magic card. Someday I will actually be able to follow that up with something important, but when, if, when and if I ever get an interview with Blizzard Entertainment and, and, and that, uh, that group, um, I'm and, and yeah, Wizards of the Coast. I'll be say I'll be able to show them in my portfolio. This is my first magic card, and just see if I can get a laugh out of them. Hopefully, I'll get a laugh and not have them just throw me out of the office. Um. So what is what is the window? They are in. He's washing the window. That's the window so frame. What, when they're talking about it, what is the window? The, you said you knew what it was. So it's 
It's got to be some sort of technical term. Well, you see the the framework. What that's the color part. That's the window okay. frame. What was white was the window. So it's the area of the card you get to color. Yes, or or, or drawing. That's okay. the windows. <laughs> okay so that's that's what I, how i filled the windows on his magic card with by drawing a window washer in the window now do you get it andy yes okay I, yes, I do. okay i'm, I'm awake damn it <laughs> we're not doing the drink and draw right now andy was really cute. <laughs> we're not doing the drink and draw right now andy <laughs> <laughs> I was confused. I started early. <laughs> so, I've done a lot of theater stuff. Um, and be, by doing a lot of theater stuff, people have asked me to design their posters. Um, gave me a chance to do something that had Drew Struzan type of thoughts. Um, this is a piece I did for the uh, uh, New Hampshire Rotary Club. They were doing this magic of movies and television musical tribute. And so, that's what I designed for them. They loved it. Um, I've done more sports stuff. This was uh, stuff done for Holman Stadium in Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, before um, uh, Hank Aaron, uh, is it Hank Aaron? Before Hank Aaron was the first in professional baseball, uh, first African-American in professional baseball, there were these two gentlemen um, in Nashville, New Hampshire, and it was a minor league team um the nashua dodgers uh the farm uh, uh uh league um who they were the first players african-american players on a u.s baseball team professional or semi-pro they these guys were the first and i got asked to do a massive full-time um display uh artworks for the stadium these are six foot tall artworks that are outside of the stadium on permanent display and i'm pretty proud of them they, they, these were these were fun to do but it's more work that i've done i've done some sci-fi stuff uh for for the city um there was one year they asked me to uh come up with a, a musical program uh cover um, that was going to be uh, done on May the 4th. And I looked at them and I'm like, you brought it to me to do a design for a music festival on May the 4th. Do you want it to be? And they're like, that's why we brought it to you. So I designed a whole band um, to do for the New Muse Music and Art Festival. And it's a group of aliens for a May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Star Wars worthy band. So, let's see. I've done a lot of t-shirt designs. Um, this t-shirt design was a favorite um, when I uh, it was actually at my first Gen Con that I that I that I uh, uh, participated in as an artist. Um, and I was sitting at my booth, and Larry Elmore came by. I had no idea who he was. I, it, it, it was just an older guy um, walking in front of me, a little white-haired gentleman. And he said, I, I, I like this. This is funny. And I said, thank you. And I went immediately into my sales pitch. And he's just smiling and, and nodding. And, and I have no idea who I'm talking to. And he, he says, well, maybe I'll be back around. And he walks away. A um, couple hours later, I walk over to the Larry Elmore booth. He's not in the art show proper. He's got his own booth. I walk over there and there's this crowd of people around and obviously an artist who's, who's, who's the main attraction. I'm looking through uh, prints and everything. I, I want to buy something so I can get it uh, signed. Pick one out, wait in line, wait in line. And finally it's my turn and the crowd uh, separates so that I can see who it is. And there is the white haired nice gentleman who had been at my booth and he just smiles and goes hi how you doing i'm like oh god and he's, he's come here let me sign it this is this is priceless i gotta sign this and i still have the print but um that's how i met the uh artistic guy 
uh, for TSR, Larry Elmore. Um, great guy. Um, anyway, um, I got into steampunk. And because of steampunk, I mean, this piece is one of uh, the first one I did that, that really I thought was any good. And there's the funny thing about this one is that I almost took out the best part. Uh, I thought it was too much. Um, my daughter loves this piece because the guy is screaming like a girl and the woman is looking like, bring it. Bring it now. I, I'm ready for you. Um, she loves this piece. But I almost took out her gunbrella. And the steampunk folks that were at the con, that when I did this piece, are like, no, that's the best part. Leave it in. I'm like, okay, okay. So this is a t-shirt design I did that it started me off down steampunk. Um, after this piece, I got asked to be part of the Norman Rockwell Museum steampunk exhibition. And I did a piece for them based on a piece uh, uh, or a uh, quote from him. Each of the artists uh, just, uh, being part of the exhibition were given a quote. Um, and told to create a piece of artwork based on the quote. I did my piece, um, and this is a piece, the, the quote for this was, um, oh, it's not that there's too many fools in the world, it's that the lightning's not distributed properly. Um, and this is what was to come of it. Um, so I did a lot of steampunk for a while, and that led me to meeting a gentleman by the name of Andrew Ragland, who was working with FASA, uh, heading up uh, their 1879 line. And he says, love your steampunk stuff. How about let's do some work uh, together? And I started working with 1879 and FASA games from the steampunk. So you never know. I guess the whole point of all this different stuff that I've shown you is you never know what's going to hit where the lightning is going to strike. Um, for me, it was steampunk and and being in a place where the, that steampunk work can be seen. Um, so I've I did this piece, what was one of the first pieces I did for uh, FASA. I did the uh, Aristocrat Elf uh, in 1879. Also early, early on um, in 1879 working for them. And it just led to more and more brighter things. Now, one of the things it, it, as far as process and me, I, everything I draw starts with guidelines. Um, my art director, my fiance, she took me to um, the uh, Boston Museum of Fine Art to kind of recharge me. And I'm... I, 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 she didn't know it was there, but the Da Vinci exhibition was there at that time in the Da Vinci sketches. And if you look at the Da Vinci sketches, you can see all the preliminary guidelines on his sketches. You can see everything, that, uh, that the whole process of him working. It's not just messy uh, extra pieces of line work. This is how he developed his illustrations or his, his art, his, his, his portraits and his, and his studies. And right there I knew, if guidelines are good enough for Da Vinci, they're good enough for anybody else, including my, the students who don't like leaving the guidelines and they, they erase the hell out of their paper, ripping up their papers, trying to get rid of all the excess guidelines. It was a, a, a great thing uh, for me, but the thing about guidelines is that they're supposed to be guidelines. They're not written in stone. Just because you put a guideline down doesn't mean that's the line that is the jawline or the hairline or the where the ear is or where it's just a basic placement so that you can start working things out guidelines are not written in stone now this is a thumbnail rough and i'm really getting into process now this is a thumbnail rough for a cover for an 1879 book big trouble in little soho I put five of these guys together, five of these thumbnail. This is where I'm trying to put everything together 
And I took this to my first master's class where my mentor was going to be an artist by the name of Gregory Manches. Greg Manches. Um, he, uh, you might know him from the work he did uh, for um, Over the Timberline, Above the Timberline. Um, great book. Uh, fantastic artist. But I did a bunch of these thumbnails. But see how rough it is? It's not the finished drawing. And this is where guidelines are important because this is just to set things up. It's for me to map out the composition. The artist to map out the composition. But I took this one. And I said, okay, got to have a few ideas for uh, uh, people to, to look through. This one, again, one guy and he's, he's painting a mini. And I thought this was a great way to express what the book's about. It's about an RPG and somebody, and in this case, it's a troll and he's, uh, or snark, and he is painting a mini that he's going to use in the game 1879. I thought it was a great premise, a, a nice uh, uh, concept. Another one where people are looking in through the window. Um, there's even a kind of a reference to it, like a Ripper type character down here in the in the uh, right hand corner. Um, but again, you've got uh, a dwarf, an elf, a human, a uh, uh, a troll, and they're looking into uh, getting into the bad guy's lair through that uh, upper window. Um, this is the kind of stuff I had read in in the manuscript so that I could decide what I'm going to do for a cover for Big Trouble in Little Soho. Um, another one where it's even closer into the window. Um, and another look, another view, trying to come up with a book cover idea. Now, I showed these illustrations or these thumbnail roughs to Greg Manchis and I said, okay, I know there are different assignments given to us that we can work on. This is what I want to work on for the class. Um, but I'm not sure which one's the best one to go with. Which one? And I'm so full of myself. And I'm just, oh, this is this is going to be great. He's going to love my stuff because this, oh, this is, I'm just so good. And he goes, so I get to choose which one? And I went, yes. And he goes, and he looks at the board where they're all tacked up on, on this uh, critique board. And he's like, so I get to choose. And I said, yes. And he goes, rip. And goes, none of them. <laughs> I'm like, uh, <laughs> what, what, huh? <laughs> it's like, no, none of them are, are what you need. Um, he gave me some notes. He gave me some uh, uh, ideas to continue. He, he says, do you want me to sketch it out for you? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't sketch it out for me. Tell me what you're thinking I should do. Uh, to, to, to help the piece, and he's, he told me about uh, dramatic composition. He told me about um, not everything be flat. Um, let things overlap. Let things overlap. And, I'm, and um, that led to that illustration where he almost had the, the troll down here in the right corner come farther over the dwarf and I'm like but if you do that the dwarf's going to be gone and he said F your dwarf Higgins it's a better piece that way and I'm like ah, ah. and that became like the thing for the rest of the class F your dwarf Higgins F your dwarf but this is the composition that finally went um, for the master's class and this is the original illustration done for Big Trouble in Little Soho from there, I brought it into my iPad Pro, where I colorized it in Procreate. And that's how that came out. So that's really the process. Get your composition. Do five different versions of it. Find the one that has a lot of dramatic uh, angles, a lot of dramatic lighting. Where's your light? Where's your dark? Where's where's the in between? Where where's the drama? Find those things. Get the composition right. Get your guidelines set up. Do the piece.
one thing I really emphasize when I'm working with, with uh, students and things like that is one drawing to get one final drawing. You may do 50 drawings to get to the final drawing. And it's all bits and pieces that you've learned. Okay, this works, that works, that doesn't work. Do a sketch of this character. Do a sketch of that character. Okay, that gives me reference so that I can put him into this piece. Do it over. And you may do 50 drawings to get to setting up the final illustration. That's where guidelines and, and, and getting everything put together properly you got to have the patience to do it. And it, the hard part is keeping it fun so that even though it's you're working, it's not work. It's You're having fun. This is what you love to do. And it's what I love to do. This leads me to one of the biggest premises that are, or, or mottos I have for illustration. Draw what you see, not what you know. Now, a lot of people don't understand what that means. Draw what you see, not what you know, is all about, well, if I said, okay, here's my phone. There it is right there. Draw it. Well, most people would just sit there and go, okay, it's a rectangle. It's got a circle in it. The, and they wouldn't even look at it. The angle that you're seeing it, the shades, the, the lights, the, 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 the oval. It's not a ab, ab, exact circle from the angle that you're looking at. Draw what you see, not what you know. So, taking that, I get reference if I'm working on a piece. I have to be able to draw what I see. And I have to see it to draw it. So, sometimes it's in my mind's eye. Now, what's the difference between seeing it from my mind's eye... Okay, hang on, uh, finish this thought. Just let me, let me know when you're ready. Okay. There's a difference between drawing what you see in your head that you've seen before and drawing what you know. Drawing what you know is not looking at it from the perspective of what you've seen. You're just guessing. Well, I guess this goes like that. And guess like, well, yeah, that, that, well, that's close enough. Anytime you're saying, oh, that's close enough, you're drawing what you know, not what you've seen or see. That's the difference. Okay, what's the question, Andy? Um, what's the question? How does this transition to painting 3D miniatures where the focus lighting changes do mimic, e.g., movement what are say best points to look for or a set not sure about the last part okay now say it slower and me yeah let's try that so how does this transition to painting 3d miniatures where the focus slash lighting changes and then it's do mimic example movement what are and then like i said i'm not sure what the rest of it's saying I think he's trying to type out the clarification on that. Is he asking if I paint minis? I think so, because I, or maybe he thinks that this, that the painting is similar, which, from my understanding, it's not. Maybe, but you're an artisty artist. Is it similar? Um. Would you say that there's a transition for that? Yes, there, there, there is a, a similarity to painting miniatures actual three-dimensional objects and painting um, a, a, a painting. If I were to paint a mini in a two-dimensional painting, that's using still life processes. I set it up, I set the lights the way I want it to be, and I paint what I see. How the light is striking it there. Now, he says, no, that's not what he meant. I know, I know. I'm getting to the next part. If I were oh. to do it that way, if I were to paint a mini into a two-dimensional painting, that's what I would do. If I were painting a mini, an actual two-dimensional or three-dimensional object, and I'm actually painting the mini, 
what would I do as far as lighting, where things are going, as, as I'm, I have to think about what I'm going to use the Mini for, where it's going to sit, and what's the surfaces it's going to sit on. For example, if I'm painting a um, dark character, and that character's miniature is going to sit on a dark surface all the time, I have to lighten everything up on that mini so that I can see it, see, see the, 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 the um, contrast in the light and shadows of that mini so it's not just a black blob on a black background. So learning where the contrasts are and knowing where it's going to be used is how I would decide how to paint a mini. Is that what he's talking about? Um, what he had said is, is, no, I'm trying to use the lighting concept. So a 3D, where do we focus for best light? A set combat with movement. I'm, I, I, he's I, trying for another example, so I'm not sure. As I understand him, um, it's all about where it's being used and thinking about keeping the contrast up. Light and uh, uh, the the lighter paints on a dark on a dark field, so that he can his mini can be seen clearly. He's typing, so maybe. I have not painted a lot of minis, so I am not sure. This is answering his question. Yes. So, my question, because you've done so much for so many things. Yes. And, like, I didn't know that window was a defined term for artists. How do people who aren't artistic learn better artistic lingo? How do we learn the jargon so that we're better communicators? Uh, for commissioning art? Is that what you're talking about? Okay, so that you you want to be able to learn the language of an artist so that you can discuss art with them and they don't for laugh at you. Purposing. For purposing and they don't laugh at you. Um, hang out with artists. Take a class. Actually do drawing. Whether you're good, bad, indifferent, that's what I hate. Um, people said, oh, there's, this guy's better than me, so I, there's no point in trying. No. Nobody is better better than anybody else Don, people have more ex people have more experience people have different styles but the point of art is uh, and illustration uh, if, or creating art is purely for the enjoyment of doing it so if it makes you happy it's a good piece of art if it makes others happy it's a good piece of art so don't get hung up on, well, they draw a hand better than I do. That leads me to another uh, ism when, I, when I'm, I'm working with artists uh, and young artists is, I can't draw that. I can't draw that. No, you're not allowed to say that ever, 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 ever again. You can't draw that yet. That, That's a good attitude. Exactly. So you, just because you haven't mastered it right now, doesn't mean you're not going to be able to later. Alright, he tried one more example. Let's see if this helps. Okay. As For example, as the item moves through, say, a, quote, live scene without the ability to Photoshop later, so in real time, if someone saw on the YouTube from one angle, cool, the other angle, not so much. I'm still not getting it. I don't know. I think we'll, we'll move on. Maybe he can write it up later and we'll get a better idea. Unless you understand it. I, 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 he wants everybody to be able to see the same color 
Okay. Accounting for moving for lighting. Okay. My art director. Stand up, Tony. No. Please stand up, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> my art come director. Hi, come say hi to everybody. Hi. This is my fantastic hi. fiance. Hello. <laughs> she has handed me this, which are dark characters. She likes to paint minis. So what we're trying to, I, I, if I understand this guy's question. The angle and the light, it, it's very hard to see. When this was photographed, the detail in the photograph of the, of the detailed painting is lost because the lighting is not good on that photograph. It's just two blobs. There's no detail because the colors are so dark. They all blend together when they're small. So I'm I'm wondering if he's asking, how do I get more detail available so that people across the table, as well as himself, see the same character clearly? Part of the issue is the size of the mini. People across the table are not going to see all the information you do when you're sitting right on top of it. People, when it passes across the table from, from one part of the field to the next, are not going, they're just not going to see it. So what do you do to paint the minis so that it's better? And that is about contrast contrasting colors next to each other. If if I were an inch tall wearing this jacket and um, uh, 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 a sweatshirt, if the sweatshirt were another level of this kind of green across the table, you wouldn't be able to see the shirt if it were across uh, one inch tall across the table the contrast of the green and the white is what's going to make that mini stand out the same way it does when you're sitting on top of it in the light you're seeing it and across the table contrasting colors so that you can see both colors on top of it in bright light and when it's far away in dimmer light. The contrasts are what you're going to see. I hope that helps. I think so, because he seemed to say that that was it and that you had it. Okay. So, when you're painting your minis, contrast. Contrasting colors. Try and keep it so that they're in the same realm. If you have a very earthy character, but try and figure out what the contrasts are going to be so that those things stand out. I hope that helps. Back to draw what you see, what, not what you know. I took had a photograph taken of me for a character I was doing. I needed to see the expression. I couldn't just guess. I mean, I know bug-eyed and, and, and so forth uh, to, to draw a character if I, if I had to do it quickly to, to do a thumbnail. But to do the final, to get the final ready, I had to start here. I do a quick sketch. That quick sketch leads to the blue line drawing, the setup, the layout. Everything gets cleaned up. The layout to the final drawing, the final pencil graphite drawing. Now remember, that's where I started. And then after that, the color. Drawing what I see. You have to be able to draw what you see. You have to be able to draw what is so that you can draw what isn't. And that's the trick of being a fantasy or an artist in general, to my, to, to my 
definition. You have to be able to draw what is so that you can play with it and be able to draw what isn't. What we see, this is the next part, what we see depends mostly on what we're looking for. So draw what you see, not what you know. But what we see depends mainly on what we're looking for. Now, when I've done talks in front of kids and gone to, to like uh, elementary schools and things like that, get about 20 kids together and they're all watching you draw and they're all watching you do things. I'm, I'm running out of time. Oh, man. Anyway, when you I, I got a bunch of kids together, they're all doing some uh, looking at this stuff and there's always one kid in the back. And he's like, and he's thinking, and I know, okay, here, it, that's the kid. Here it comes. And he'll fiddle fart around for a while, but he won't say it. And finally, he'll raise his hand. I'm like, here it comes. What is it, son? And he looks at me and he goes, you say draw what you see, not what you know. And I say, yes. He goes, but you draw dragons. And I say, yeah, I see dragons. Why don't you? And he's like, what? And his, the teacher in the back or his mother in the back is like, excuse me, you see dragons? What? Huh? And I'm like, what is a dragon? And all the kids are like, um, it's a fire-breathing dragon. I'm like, okay, but what is a dragon? In its simplest terms, a dragon is a large lizard. Now, what does this large lizard have? Does it have wings? Yes. Okay, what kind of wings are they? Well, they're big and leathery and, and skin, and, and they're not feathers, they're skin. It's like, okay, what has that that you know of? And they all go, bats. And I said, so you get a picture of a bat, and you get a picture of a lizard, and you put them together. I see a dragon. Why don't you? And all the little lights go off over their head. Bang! And they get it, and they understand. I love that moment, that, that when they get it moment. That's what I mean by... What we see depends mainly on what we're looking for. So, when I didn't, when when I would needed to push forward, I was stagnant. I wasn't getting anywhere. Everything looked the same. I in 2016 put together a book, my 365 character creature concept challenge, one a day, every day. For a year. Did this in 2016. It was done in, intentionally to push me to see things better, to, to, to draw better, to draw more things, to draw pretty, if I had to draw a pretty woman, just to be able to sit down and draw a pretty woman. It I, I had to push myself. I wasn't getting anywhere. So in 2016, I did this book. Um, huh, funny story, I told it the other night. But the 365, it was done in 2016, and I got about halfway through, and it was rough, but I, I got about halfway through. I finished it, but at the halfway point, my art director, Tony, my fiance, she looks at me and she goes, why are you calling it a 365? And I'm like, one a day for a year? Duh. And she gets this look at her face, and she goes, you realize 2016's a leap year, right? And I'm like, uh... I get a day off, right? Yeah, yeah, a day off. She goes, not anymore, you done. Go, gonna dumb me again. <laughs> so there I was, stuck. I There, there is a third, 366th illustration in the book. But this is one of those exercises to push you harder. And it was just a quick sketch. It wasn't meant, meant to be an all-day drawing every day. This was just like a warm-up sketch push yourself an exercise artists need, I, I i hope other artists do things like this as well um but that's something that i did to push myself that's one of the um alien creatures this one actually i gave it to somebody i met at a, a local sci-fi convention uh comic book and sci-fi convention and she was one of the uh actresses who was on star trek discovery at the time and um, she said, I'm taking this to Glenn. And I, wanted, I want him to create this for me for my, uh, for the, for the uh, crew's um, 
uh, uh, Halloween party. And I said, y you're putting one of my illustrations in front of Glenn Hetrick? And she goes, yeah, you know Glenn? I was like, no, but I'd love to. <laughs> but I don't know if it ever happened, but just thinking that this actually went in front of Glenn. Wow. Um, this was another weird piece. Uh, it's starting with nothing. Guidelines. It started with um, just this odd look on a, on a character's face and then adding that little bit more, adding that little bit more, adding that little bit more. Um, I don't understand where my head was, but that's, that's what came of it. Uh, Junior Ghostbuster. Soothsayer. Not so abominable snowman. This came from the uh, face off from Sci Fi uh, Channel. Um, they wanted everybody uh, on their show to create a Star Wars worthy bounty hunter. I took it as a challenge and, and I did it for my 365. Bye. This is a. I know, I'm running, I'm out of time. Yes, sir. I'm going to wrap this up as fast as I can. Not a problem, absolutely. All right. Uh, this was done for uh, Demon World. They needed elves. A family of elves. You can see all the influences. You can see where I was going with things. This was also uh, done... Uh, this was a uh, Nasher. Um, split jaw Nasher. But again, drawing what you see. Getting pieces. Getting uh, uh, everything together. This was done for 1879. Two different kinds of gold, uh, 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 goblins. This one was done for 1879. It all depends on the, the direction you're given from the art director, where you go. One goblin isn't everybody's goblin. Feathered dragon, serpent dragon. Leviathan. A cocky giant. The color version, spies, gamblers, dragon killers, bar fight, another piece for um, the uh, upcoming uh, Sourds on the Grovener Express. This was done for 1879, um, uh, the Dragon's Chapter Divider. That's now the poster design for 1879. More work for Game Masters and for Player's Companion. Cover for Hey Penny Pie. Cover for Champion's Challenge. So I'm going to finish off as far as the process. Three things to remember. Draw what you see, not what you know. With that, remember what we see depends mostly on what we're looking for. Me, I see dragons. Why don't you? I hope you enjoyed this. I hope this was enlightening to some of you. I hope you got to, uh, to without me actually doing more drawing, because I've been doing drawing during the during the week, or, or during the weekend, um, in I uh, on the uh, drink and draw and on the the comics thing. I hope you saw something that inspired you. I hope I answered that gentleman's question. Um, so with that, Andy, unless there's another question, I need to sign out.